dedicated to each and every one of you who appreciate a great glass of wine. You know what I mean? It's Monday. Let's raise a glass to the beginning of another week. It's time to unscrew, uncork, or saber a bottle. And let's begin exploring the wine glass. Today, we return to Oregon to discuss their red wine production. Oregon grows more than 70 different grape varieties, but their name is almost synonymous with Pinot Noir. However, don't be surprised to see Mencia or Blockenfrosch on the wine list, just to name a couple. Listen in as Oregon winemakers discuss Pinot Noir, along with some newer and less popular grape varieties as they are excited to be working with. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, you know that many ask for Patreon. We do not plan on doing this, but we do ask you to support the podcast by leaving a review. It takes only a few seconds of your time, but means so much to the show. The next best way to support Exploring the Wine Glass is to tell your friends. If you enjoy the podcast, your wine-loving friends will too. Finally, don't forget to head to the website, exploringthewineglass.com, to read the blog and sign up for the newsletter so you can keep up with all the happenings. Slancha. Hey everybody, I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program, Spanish wine scholar, Somme Day service, champagne and Cote de Ron specialist, and a WSET level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time to swipe, subscribe, rate, and review. Stay in the know about all things wine by visiting my website, exploringthewineglass.com. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. You are special. We are going to dive in today into uh, Oregon's regional red wines. Uh, so last, uh, the last seminar or webinar, we conquered the regional whites. Um, and since, you know, Oregon does grow more than 70 different grape varieties, there's certainly a lot to cover, uh, but we're going to focus on uh, those varieties that really have um, a meaningful amount of plantings um, across Oregon and um, especially in the major AVAs. Uh, so here is one of my favorite pictures uh, from Oregon, which is Mount Hood cloud catcher that you can generally see almost anywhere uh, where you are in sort of the North Valley, um, northern part of Oregon, whether you're in the Columbia Gorge or the northern Willamette Valley. Um, and truly across that uh, Columbia Gorge and Willamette Valley area, um, this is where there's so many grape varieties planted and the bulk of our production is planted. Um, just so everyone is up to speed, as we continue to grow as um, a state and as a region and continue to mature, our producers um, are really seeking out to further define our um, Appalachians or American viticultural areas as they're called um, here in the US, so AVAs. So Oregon has 23 AVAs now. Um, several of those are cross-border AVAs, which we share with either Washington or Idaho. Um, so we have uh, two that are in the, um, uh, sorry, three that are in the um, northern part shared with Washington, um, that being Columbia Gorge on the western end, uh, Columbia Valley, and then Walla Walla Valley shared with Washington. And then Idaho, we share the Snake River Valley um, ABA with, which is just an absolutely stunningly dramatic ABA, um, really carved by um, the, that really powerful river system, same as the Columbia River system. We'll chat a little bit about that as we get into um, why Oregon is such a great place for fine quality wine growing, um, and those river systems really have a lot to do with it. That said, um, the major ABAs, um, the Willamette Valley and Southern Oregon ABA is really where most of the growth is happening in the ABA expansion. Um, in 1983, the Willamette Valley ABA was, um, was 
um, settled or started. And uh, within that, we now have um, over 10 uh, different AVAs. So um, we are really expanding, really getting to know our place. And um, those producers that are based in these AVAs are really starting to define uh, what makes a fine quality region and why these place names or areas should really be carved out and discussed as unique and individual um, terroirs or regions within the Willamette Valley. So be sure to check out a few of those new ones. Um, the Van Duza Corridor AVA, Mount Pisgah, uh, Polk County, Lower Long Tom, Laurelwood and Tualatin Hills are all the newest AVAs in the Willamette Valley. So just to get a sense of really where the production for Oregon wine is happening um, across the state, the Willamette Valley does have the bulk of plantings uh, and production with Southern Oregon coming swiftly in behind as well and continuing to expand. Uh, both AVAs are really expanding each year. Uh, the Columbia Gorge to the north and Columbia Valley and Walla Walla Valley are also regions where growth is really thriving as other agricultural areas and um, wooded logging parcels are really um, starting to be uh, transferred across into um, high quality vineyard um, uh, estates. This is where we're starting to see a lot of growth um, in where other agriculture um, and industries are starting to slow down. So Oregon's top uh, grape varieties, as I mentioned earlier, we have more than 70. I think we're up above 80 by now. Um, as foundation plant services um, continue to release more and more um, varieties that have been um, certified as clean plant material and brought into the US, um, we have more and more access through our nursery systems to uh, purchase different grape varieties and really see um, what um, variety of uh, varietal material can be planted here in Oregon to make fine wine, um, whether it's uh, Gruneveltliner, Riesling, um, Chasselas, um, you know, Blaufrankisch, Menthea. There's a host of varieties that are being um, played with now um, for, you know, commercial use that are really um, starting to shine and just really show what Oregon can do in terms of making premium quality wines. So Oregon's top red varieties, which are going to be our focus today, obviously Pinot Noir makes up the bulk with it being planted in every AVA um, and primarily in the Willamette Valley and Southern Oregon AVAs. Uh, however, the next um, largest variety, which is continuing to increase um, at a rate of knots, especially in uh, the Rogue Valley of Southern Oregon uh, and the Walla Walla Valley, um, is Syrah. It's really increasing quite swiftly. Figures are all current. I just haven't um, wiped out that 2020 on the bottom of the report. Pinot Noir being the major variety, Syrah coming up strong behind that. Um, also Cabernet Sauvignon, 5% um, of plantings, um, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, the Bordeaux varieties are also increasing, uh, and Tempranillo um, has a well-established history in Oregon as well, um, and in fact is the first place uh, where Tempranillo was planted in the U.S., so we'll get to that later as well. But as you can see, um, the obsession with Pinot Noir continues. Uh, however, there is just a, a lot of engagement with other varieties as they come on board. Keep in mind, though, that since this information comes from the um, Oregon Wine Board's Vineyard and Winery Report, the Oregon Vineyard and Winery Report, which is um, a survey that is sent out to growers and producers. It's not a mandatory survey, it is volunteer, uh, and not every grape variety is listed on there. So the, the section of other on here sits at around um, 8%. Um, so there's a lot of other varieties that are not being um, identified in the vineyard and winery report, simply because it would be an, uh, an ongoing, never-ending seemingly um, survey to fill out for for producers, but exciting to see what growth is happening out there in the varietal sector.
Uh, so what makes what Oregon really great for growing uh, fine wine? It's a combination of a lot of factors. So um, for one thing, our growing season is uh, generally very free from uh, a lot of rainfall. We have uh, basically from June until mid-September, really um, long sunny days with high UV and very limited cloud cover. So bl big blue skies, lots of access to sunshine. We also have um, a very cool northerly latitude, which is further cooled and moderated by river systems and the Pacific Ocean to our west. Uh, and all of that contributes to making grapes that are very fresh, um, but have great ripeness um, and that ripen at a protracted rate. So meaning that they develop flavor development without just developing sugars. Um, so more moderate um, alcohol wines with fresher acidity um, and moderate to firm tannins really means that these wines are really great for food friendly and aging potential. We also have uh, fairly young, vigorous soils. So marine sedimentary bedrock is our uh, most ancient soil. Uh, we'll discuss this in next uh, the next webinar um, a little bit deeper. Uh, but just to give you the baseline, marine sedimentary soils that are really free draining, um, more nutrient poor than the younger volcanic soils. The volcanic soils retain water a lot better, um, but that also leads to um, quite a lot of vigor as well in the vineyard. Um, so this um, combined with our climate also allows us uh, in many areas to dry farm or farm our grapes without irrigation. Um, so that's one thing that does uh, stand Oregon apart from California and Washington um, is that ability to really grow fine wine at um, uh, high quality levels without the need for irrigation uh, during that growing season. Uh, we also have um, a lot of uh, biodynamic and sustainable and organic producers um, who are committed to those practices and increasingly viticulturists that are committed to those practices as well. Um, as uh, anyone will tell you as well, the terroir of um, a place is very um, uh, is is also influenced by um, the people who are growing on it and working it. So um, a lot of our viticulturists are very um, conscious about, uh, you know, what they're putting on their land, what they're putting on their fruit and what their um, growers, uh, their, their workers are really um, putting on the vine. So very organic, um, uh, conscious minded practices uh, and also not polluting our riverways that are often salmon run as well. Um, most of our uh, producers or a lot of them actually live on their estates. So there's just a lot more attention to detail for being on that, you know, living in the place um, that you're working every day as well. So these uh, basically are the uh, how the soils formed. So we had um, the uh, Juan de Fuca and North American plates collide, which brought up the marine sediments and created a series of underwater volcanic eruptions that really raised um, our major um, our coast range and uh, cascade mountain systems, which are what define and help to control um, the weather elements in, in Oregon as well. You can see the uh, mighty Columbia River there in the in that uh, left hand image is um, really helps to moderate uh, the the climate there and facilitate airflow between the eastern part of the state and the western cool Pacific Ocean. That river system was further um, uh, really defined and carved out by the Missoula floods, which was the last uh, real dramatic um, uh, soil or um, um, uh, really soil carving system that happened um, and formed some of our youngest soils. So we have a lot of um, windblown loess and glacially carved um, fine grained basalt low soils that are um, fine grained volcanic sediments lying on top of um, deep basalt bedrocks and then below that the marine sedimentary profiles. This is mostly occurring in the north of the state, um, in the northern part of the Willamette Valley and all along the Columbia River Gorge and uh, out into Walla Walla. Uh, in the southern part of the state and south of Salem, 
Salem, we have primarily um, ancient marine sediments and alluvial um, soils that are carved out from the moving of river systems that have happened over millennia. Um, so these uh, geographical landmarks of Oregon are really important to um, the styles of wine that we're able to grow here um, and also um, to really, um, you know, influencing the size of our industry and the amount of growth um, that Oregon wine can achieve as well. So we're really defined by these very cool river systems, quite large river systems. The Columbia River in the north, which separates Washington and Oregon, is the fourth largest river in the U.S. and it really um, sends a lot of powerful water out into that Pacific Ocean uh, from the Blue Mountains. Uh, from the Blue Mountains in the east there flows down into um, between Oregon and Idaho in that Snake River Valley, a very, a very deeply carved glacial river valley um, that is uh, starting to show a lot of promise uh, for high elevation, um, uh, almost desert-like growing and irrigation out there is required um, and, and along uh, the northern Washington border as well. So irrigation coming from the Columbia River and the Snake River uh, for those vineyards, um, but also that also allows uh, more diversity of uh, grape varietal plantings to occur as well and also more um, late ripening varieties as well. In the Willamette Valley, the Willamette Valley is actually situated around the Willamette River and the Willamette River watershed. So that's what defines the AVA boundaries. Um, and so that Willamette River is a very important river system that has a lot of tributaries that flow off of it um, that really help to moderate the vineyards in the, in the Willamette Valley along with the Pacific Ocean. So there are several... Um, uh, low-lying points in the coast range, which is a lo fairly low-lying mountain range um, that blocks a lot of that really cool Pacific Ocean weather and uh, Pacific Ocean storms um, from really impacting uh, the Willamette Valley during the growing season. So it tends to act as a benevolent cooling um, uh, process that means that when the interior of, um, of Oregon heats up and we really get a hot weather push that blows down the Columbia River and across the Cascades, um, that Pacific Ocean that sort of acts like a vacuum and pushes back in, cooling down the Willamette Valley after just a few days. So when you're here in Oregon during the summer, we have beautiful sunny days and you know weather that's often in above uh, the mid 90s, but that weather Weather will often uh, only be around for three to four days before that Pacific Ocean pushes back and cools it down again. So we have a lot of um, we have a lot of really um, you know nice moderation uh, to our weather patterns, which means that our uh, grapes don't get overly baked in the sun as well and desiccated. So continuing that protracted, uh, really uh, complex layered uh, flavor development because of the moderating influences of the Pacific Ocean there. Um, moving further south into the uh, greater southern Oregon Appalachian, which is really split into two Appalachians, the Umpqua Valley AVA and the Rogue Valley AVA. Again, both defined by river systems as well. The Umpqua River that uh, runs out into the Pacific Ocean through Elkton AVA. Um, again, most of the plantings um, in both the Willamette Valley and Umpqua Valley are planted on the western um, sides of the AVAs as well. But this means that there's also a lot of opportunity for continued growth uh, on the eastern foothills of the, co of the Cascade Ranges there. Moving down into the Rogue Valley, uh, the Rogue River and Applegate Rivers are really what provide um, a lot of the irrigation and wind movements and cooling uh, influences in the Rogue Valley AVA. These rivers have moved um, over time. And so a lot of the vineyards now are actually planted 
on what is old riverbed soils uh, from these rivers as they carve their way through the valley and change over time. Uh, so really lots of uh, lot, uh, deep free draining soil that's not incredibly vigorous uh, and has a lot of um, stones uh, to warm up and really heat these grapes and allow for um, a wider diversity of grape growing to happen in, in these AVAs. So mountains and river systems are really important for Oregon for how it how these moderate um, our elevations, the aspects of the vineyards that we're able to plant on and how they really moderate the cooling and heating of our vineyard systems, giving us a really moderate um, climate to grow grapes in, um, which allows great flavor development at moderate alcohol levels and a re good retention of acidity as well. The other factor um, that's important is our region's latitude. So I mentioned earlier that we're a cool northerly region. Um, we do sit between 42 and 46 degrees north of um, the equator. So a northerly latitude, which means that during the winter months, we have very limited um, daylight hours. Um, and during the summer months, we have um, from 5 a.m. Uh, through to nearly, nearly 10 p.m. at night. So 15 to 16 hours of daylight during the growing season. And we know that um, it's not only heat that's important to ripening grapes. Sunlight into wine is a real thing and we need to have UV sunshine hitting those grape clusters. And because of our gentle um, northerly um, leaning, we get a more gentle sun onto our fruit as well. Um, so that combined with our cooling influences of our river systems, um, our the cool air drainage off the mountains and off of the Pacific Ocean, all of those items combine to give us a really mo a moderate um, sunshine that feels quite warm, but it's not warm enough to burn the fruit. And what that means is that uh, unlike in California and in Washington, where they have quite harsh sunshine that is really capable of burning the fruit there, um, we can expose our uh, grapes to the sunshine um, at uh, an earlier time and allow this gentle sunshine to help ripen our grapes. Um, even though we may have a slightly cooler growing season, we get full flavor development because of that UV, um, additional UV and sunshine heat access. Uh, this is the other thing that's important in Oregon as well, is that during the crucial growing season from mid-June through to mid-September, um, early October, we have very limited rainfall. And as you can see in the crucial months of July, August, and September, we have barely any rainfall. We have barely any clouds in the sky. And this is very different to places like Burgundy and Bordeaux, where they continue to have constant rainfall and cloud cover during that crucial um, growing months there. So this also leads to us being able to more uh, fully embrace organic farming practices and biodynamic farming practices because we don't have as much disease pressure during those months. Uh, so that means that our soil has less compaction from tractors and our people don't have to spray as much um, and our river systems don't get as impacted by um, those sulfur sprays that can um, you know, flow down down into the soils and then into the river systems. So a lot more conscious farming practices are able to happen uh, because of our very favorable uh, climate conditions. Uh, and the other thing that uh, is important is that we are a community of really small artisan producers. Um, most Oregon wineries produce less than 5,000 cases per year. Um, and there are multiple producers in California and Washington that make more wine than all of the wineries in Oregon combined. So while we only make up 1% of uh, US fine wine production, we really over deliver in our quality profile um, because of all of those other reasons that I've just been through as well. And because we are small estate producers, we're in the vineyard more, we're on our land more and making those decisions for the benefits of our family and our vineyard stewards and our staff that we work with day in, day out. 
um, small, smaller farming practices are important uh, for being able to be reactive uh, in a growing season and really be held accountable for your um, farming conditions as well. Uh, so biodynamics and regenerative and organic farming really does, um, is on the increase. Um, and Oregon has some of the highest, highest um, uh, certified biodynamic and regenerative organic certifiers um, in the US here. Um, more and more people are looking at the regenerative organic farming practices, which include bringing um, animals and livestock into the vineyard, primarily sheep, for grazing um, instead of um, tractors uh, for tillage um, and further compacting the soil. So trying to um, grow and um, farm responsibly in a, a whole ecosystem, a holistic ecosystem. Okay, let's move into the grape varieties. Um, Pinot Noir is uh, the state's number one grape variety and with good reason, it has a great legacy of producing high quality fine wines uh, that stand up to some of the world's best Pinot Noirs. And this is further um, being confirmed as the vines um, get older, um, as we have more clonal material selections um, that are really, um, really starting to shine in Oregon as well. And also, again, as our producers, our farmers and our winemakers um, are traveling more and also having more experience with their land and with their, um, with their materials, Every year, the um, quality of Oregon Pinot Noir continues to rise and we continue to, um, you know, be outstanding in the world of, of Pinot Noir um, growing globally. So um, it is the most planted red, red variety in both the Willamette Valley and in Southern Oregon, um, although most people are not so aware that it was uh, the first planting of it was actually in the Umpqua Valley in 1960 by Richard Summers. Uh, and then it followed into the Willamette Valley in 1965 by a handful of, of gentlemen who uh, mostly came up from California to establish vineyards uh, in the Willamette Valley. Um, sadly, there's just a handful of own rooted um, plantings that remain from uh, production that hasn't been impacted by phylloxera. And these plantings are really those that are the most isolated and don't have other vineyards um, or are sharing uh, vineyard equipment. Uh, so David Hill Winery um, is one of the majors out on the Tualatin Hills that still has full um, deep rooted um, old vines that are um, not on rootstock and are not suffering from phylloxera. There's also a couple in the Shehalem Mountains in the Laurelwood AVA, um, and of course, uh, still some at Irie as well. Uh, so the, these vineyards are really the um, you know, jewels in the crown and produce a very different Pinot Noir than those that are on rootstock um, in, the, in the other parts of, this, of the um, state and AVA. So what do we know about Pinot Noir besides that it's Oregon's uh, number one variety? It is a fairly thin skinned grape, uh, which is why so many uh, original producers really focused on bringing Pinot Noir to the Northwest being that this was such a cool wet climate in comparison to California. However, as I mentioned earlier, that unique UV aspect means actually that the skins of Pinot Noir here in, in Oregon and the Willamette Valley are actually thicker um, than they would be in an area that doesn't have as much wind impact and as much sunshine impact. So as a result, Oregon's Pinot Noirs tend to be slightly deeper in color and um, slightly fleshier uh, and a little riper um, because of that lack of uh, any cloud cover or rain that's going to um, dilute the fruit or, or hamper the quality. So we can really push the ripeness um, and flavor development of our Pinot Noirs here because of our unique climate. Uh, that said, we're still mostly sitting um, as Pinot Noir 
in a medium bodied, uh, sometimes full bodied, moderate alcohol, um, uh, moving some in some years into a higher alcohol profile, but primarily we're sitting in moderate tannins, uh, moderate alcohols, and uh, very fresh red fruit flavors. So cherries, raspberries, pomegranates, um, cranberry notes. Um, and then as we age, we definitely get more easily into mushroom, clove, tea flavors, um, some floral notes of rose and hibiscus, um, and potpourri characters as well. Um, so really um, very classical Pinot Noir flavors. Um, and depending on your proximity to the coast or to higher elevations is really what's going to determine um, your, pro your fruit profile. So warmer marine sedimentary soils um, and lower elevations tend to have more full-bodied, um, blue-fruited um, and black cherry and sometimes plum fruit profiles for Pinot Noir, while um, higher elevations as you move into the 300 through all the way up to 800, 900 feet elevations, you're starting to move into the mo more of those ethereal strawberry, hibiscus, floral red tones um, of fruit profile. Um, Pinot Noir is typically um, destemmed here in Oregon, although you are seeing a lot more uh, producers that are working with whole clusters, especially as we have continued um, drier years and the um, rachis or stems of the clusters are able to brown. And so when you're fermenting on your skins and stems, you're not um, extracting green flavors. So there have been some good um, attributes that come from a warming climate here, um, being that we can add, start to add some more uh, non-fruit complexity through those stems, um, uh, stem tannins, and not just sweet oak profiles as well. So those um, uh, whole cluster characters will um, show themselves in the wine as more baking spice, more lifted fruit characters, um, more bay leaf and clove and cinnamon bark flavor profiles. Um, typically also Pinot Noir in Oregon is not always uh, oops, not always um, over vintage. So a lot will be um, held until uh, just prior to the next harvest um, and bottled before the harvest. Um, it's only a lot of reserve bottlings or those that feel like they need some extra time in barrel that will be over vintaged. So most um, of the uh, Pinot Noirs that will currently be in your market are likely going to be the 2021s. Um, and this gives a early drinking, really lovely perfumed um, fruit forward profile to the wines as well. And now a word from our sponsor. Did you know that Dracina Wines has a wine club? We named it the Chalk Club. Draco is on our label, but Vegas was getting a bit jealous, so we decided he deserved to be our wine club's books dog. In Las Vegas, betting chalk means that you are betting on all of the favorites, and we're gambling that once you taste our wines, we will become one of your favorite wineries. The club is simple, yet a bit different than most. We don't ask for a lot of commitment like others do. Choose between three tiers, the Sweet 16, where you will receive three bottles twice a year and get 15% off all orders. Sign up for the Elite 8 and get 20% off all orders and receive four bottles twice a year, or make it to the final four and receive six bottles twice a year, as well as receiving 25% off purchases. All tiers receive discounted shipping, are customizable, and are eligible for unlimited referral bonuses. Add $15 to the bank for each person you refer. Head to www.dracinowines.com to use the link in the show notes to find out all the Chalk Club has to offer and to sign up. We've stocked the odds so that you can get our award-winning wines without breaking the bank. Gamay Noir is a variety that we're start starting to see a lot more plantings of happening in the Willamette Valley as well. And it really makes sense. It's a continuation of the Burgundian narrative. That's an easy um, conversation to have, um, not only with growers, but with trade as well. Um, Gamay Noir here in Oregon is a little different to how it's um, grown um, or displays itself in Beaujolais. Again, quite 
more more likely because of the climate situation in that we have the wide open skies and heat and now uh, Gamay Noir gets a lot of sunshine on its skin so it gives it really deep colors and thicker skins and these uh, Gamay Noirs in the Willamette Valley can be quite structured um, quite um, um, deeply colored uh, and have really good tannin profiles with lots of acidity. Uh, what I love about Gamay in the Willamette Valley is that it really retains its natural acidity and has such an energetic um, profile and lift to its palate. Um, that it really holds up to some of those darker fruit flavors like pomegranate and blackberry and um, some pie fruits is also a lot of spicy flavors that will come through in Gamay. And again, this is sometimes because of the preponderance of whole cluster fermentation. So including the stems in those fermentation practices really does bring out a little bit more spice, that cinnamon bark, baking spice, um, some potting soil notes. Um, and again, with the um, red spices, the rubos teas and violets and peonies um, are really some more floral attributes and um, lively spicy characters that come from Gamay Noir. Gamay in the Valley is uh, often bottled a little earlier than Pinot Noir. Um, so anywhere being bottled from say March or April through to August as well. Um, but there are some really um, great quality variety, uh, great quality Gamay Noirs being produced. Um, a lot from the uh, marine sedimentary soils in Shehalem, Yamhill Carlton, Ribbon Ridge um, AVAs as well that help to really promote some of that red fruit lift and the sweet red spices as well. Um, and this makes it a really food friendly wine and just a slightly um, more energetic um, and easily approachable style of wine as well. Um, but some great serious styles out there as well. It's going to be exciting to see what um, producers are doing with their gamay as we see more and more plantings of this grape variety going into the ground. So this is the major um, AVAs within the Northern Willamette Valley. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this with this um, AVA map. Uh, the original AVAs being Dundee Hills, Eola Amity Hills, Shehalem Mountains, McMinnville, Yamhill, Carlton, and Ribbon Ridge. Um, those are the most densely planted areas um, and are definitely focused on Pinot Noir, although because of the size of Eola Amity um, and Twelton Hills, Yamhill Carlton, there is a lot more opportunity for varietal diversity to occur. And this is where we are seeing a lot of these newer varieties um, really being experimented with and taken a chance on. Um, the Dundee Hills is you know, a, quite a small AVA along with Ribbon Ridge, and it's basically already um, planted out. So there's not too much room uh, in there anymore for really diversifying um, the plantings there. Uh, that said, there's still some really lovely Syrah, Nebbiolo, uh, Tempranillo, Gamay Noir, and of course Chardonnay in those areas as well. Uh, so very similar to what I showed overall for the state, the temperature and precipitation in the Willamette Valley. Um, we do get up into the averages of the high 90s, especially during the growing season, um, but we don't have huge diurnal temperature shifts, but they are large enough um, you know, often around 30 or 40 degrees that they are helping to preserve our fresh acidities and keep the fruit really crisp um, and pristine in its, um, in its flavor profile. You're not getting raisined, desiccated, dehydrated fruit flavors because the nights don't cool down here. We have a really lovely um, uh, diurnal temperature shift, meaning the nights will drop down to cooler temperatures um, even though the days have risen up to 90 plus temperature. Uh, again, that day length, and you can see that here, you know, in comparison to Sonoma, um, our day length is much longer, or at least two hours longer than um, some of the areas further south. And again, that wind. So wind is really important for helping to preserve acidity, but also to slow down the ripening process. So a lot of the um, 
the grapes will shut down a little during the um, ripening season. Uh, the grapes also will be impacted by the wind as well in terms of it will develop naturally thicker skins in the grapes because of strong cooling wind influences. Um, and also it will help to keep the canopy cooler and drier. And that means that we also don't have that need for um, uh, a lot of additional sprays that really helps with our rot situations as well, which is why you start to see the increase uh, in vineyards and growers really being interested in promoting organic and biodynamic farming practices um, because we can. It's um, a dry growing season with lots of wind influence, which means that rot is not as much of an issue in, in certain other areas. So now moving into Syrah and the uh, second most planted grape variety, um, according to the survey in Oregon as well. Um, Syrah is really grown all over the state also, obviously not to the extent that Pinot Noir is, but it is the grape ver that is, um, has seen the largest increase in plantings. A lot of that is occurring in the Eastern Oregon um, AVAs of uh, Walla Walla and especially the Rocks District of um, Milton Freewater. Um, you can see those cobblestone rocks or river alluvial rocks in this image here. Um, and this um, is a vineyard that is sitting down um, on that um, old ancient riverbed um, and those rocks really help to sit out on top pop and reflect the heat, warm the soils, stop evaporation from the soils um, and reflect the heat and uh, light onto the clusters during the day and also continued into the evening where the temperatures here will drop quite dramatically as well. Uh, in the Umpqua and Rogue Valleys, um, the, the Syrah and Rhone varieties are really increasing as well. Grenache is on the rise. Unfortunately, I don't have numbers for Grenache, um, but where, where Syrah is planted, there's also always a little Grenache being found as well. So Grenache, um, while it may not be, you know, 6% of the plantings, um, it's definitely being planted next to Syrah uh, and also some other Rhone varieties uh, like Mouvedra or and so are also being um, experimented with as well. So really trying to get an understanding of where our um, limits for ripening fruit are happening. Uh, and every year we're surprised um, by what is actually capable of being ripened here um, at, at good quality levels and also at moderate alcohol levels and fresher fruit flavors. Um, so that's really Oregon's key signature is its medium bodies, uh, to full bodied, but with fresh fruit flavors, moderate alcohols and fresh acidities, um, making these wines ideal for um, restaurants and food pairings and just having more energetic, lively fruit flavors and palate profiles. Um, so Syrah, we do have a variety of, of different uh, Syrah clonal selections that have been either imported from France or also from uh, Washington, which has the uh, Joseph, famed Joseph Phelps clone um, and uh, a, a, a selection of other clones. But the Phelps clone is really um, capturing the imagination of many producers in Walla Walla, uh, where it produces a really distinctive, um, complex flavor profile with spice and um, fresh blueberry um, and black plum fruits uh, and a little bit more non-fruit flavors as well in the forms of tobacco and chocolate and uh, green peppercorn flavors. Um, again, depending on the elevation and the aspect of the vineyard is going to really um, you know, determine the style of winemaking um, that um, is being made here. So whether you can include whole cluster fermentation, um, how much you're extracting from the skins, how gentle your punch downs and pump overs are going to be, um, and the exact length of fermentation on the skins, if you're able to ferment to dryness on the skins, um, is really being uh, moderated by the growing season and your regional conditions uh, and of course the cultural philosophies of the winemaker themselves. Um, so Syrah can be quite complex from around the state. Typically speaking, um, 
the wines out of Walla Walla and the Rocks District are um, very savory, um, meaty, umami bombs. Um, a lot of, you know, black olive, green olive flavors, um, a lot of almost tar-like flavors as well. Um, very deep, um, you know, dark, complex flavors coming through. Uh, in the Willamette Valley, Syrah, you know, not to anyone's surprise, looks a little bit more like the handling of Pinot Noir, um, a little bit more red and um, red and purple fruit flavor profiles, um, and a little more pepper um, coming through from that cooler um, ocean influenced um, sites as well. Moving into Southern Oregon, those really deep alluvial soils and free draining uh, rocky river soils um, are really helping to build um, perfectly ripe, you know, plum, blueberry, um, uh, fruit, 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 fruit profiles in the Syrahs down here. Um, and again, some use of whole cluster, but it's not, um, it's not a given. Um, so, and also some use of Grenache in the blend down here as well. Um, in the Rogue Valley and Applegate Valleys, it's definitely becoming known for its Rhone varieties and Syrah is absolutely leading the charge down here with again those high elevation vineyards but on um, riverbed soils means that you have really fine grained tannins, uh, ripe fruit profiles without being overblown and showing really great moderation um, of fruit, fruit flavors and alcohol levels as well. So a little bit more complexity, um, a little bit riper than the Willamette Valley but not quite to the extent of the Walla Walla style. Uh, and Syrah, you tend to find more people over vintaging this. The wines from Walla Walla and the Rocks District um, are so forward and lush that you're quite capable of um, enjoying these early in their life and you'll find some um, early bottled styles um, that haven't seen a lot of new oak influence uh, but then you also see the the opposite of that in some reserve bottlings that are really concentrated and have a lot of new oak and will be over vintaged for a couple of years before release. Um, so really a fun way to um, approach working with Syrah. And of course, there's also some Viognier co-fermented in um, many of the Syrahs around the state as well. So bringing some floral, um, uh, more fruit purity flavors by including uh, Viognier into that blend as well. Um, I know that Syrah is maybe not necessarily seen so much out in the um, general marketplace um, across the US, but it's really worth seeking out because there are some really special distinctive uh, Syrahs being made that deserve a lot of attention. Um, and this district of the Rocks District of Milton Freewater is one of those. Um, it is based around um, the the Walla Walla River, um, the old riverbed system here. So that entire area is really an ancient riverbed uh, with a lot of rocky cobbles underneath. It's a nightmare to plant vineyards here. Um, and those uh, rocks really get pulled out and put back on top of the soil here. Um, but what that means for the wines is that um, because this is quite a short growing season, you know, up until, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was still snow on the ground here in freezing conditions. Um, so the growing season is quite short. So they really rely on having these very deep um, uh, soils that the roots can tap into very deeply, uh, seeking water. Um, most vineyards here are still irrigated, but then you also need that additional warming of the very dark, um, dark brown soils, the riverbed soils warm up easily, but then you also have on top of that the cobblestones that help to, again, uh, retain the moisture in the soils, but also heat up during the hot of the day, where temperatures here can get well above 100 degrees, um, which also causes the vines to shut down and not ripen during those extreme temperatures. So it's during the evening when the evening is cooling down that those warm rocks being reflected back onto the grapes are really important for continuing the flavor development uh, and ripening of, of the grapes of the Syrah fruit happening here. And again, incredibly distinctive wines, very meaty, very savory, very umami laden wines um, that often will have some sweet oak 
um, aging on them just to bring a little bit more fruit sweetness because otherwise these wines can be like um, eating a liquid steak almost. Um, they're very complex and very interesting um, and an absolute pleasure um, to drink and to age as well. Uh, and again, Walla Walla Valley, it's hard when you see these, you know, monthly averages as they spread out over time, but the Walla Walla Valley, it's, you know, premium uh, prime growing season temperatures are definitely closer to the hundreds, the nineties and hundreds, very high, hot and dry. Um, but you can see that there's not quite as much diurnal temperature differences um, and just how short that growing season is. The one, um, Problem here in, in Walla Walla and the Rocks District is the very cold continental winters that will sometimes lead to vine death. Um, so it's a very extreme area to grow grapes and to make, uh, make wine, but the wines that come out of here are truly exceptional and really unique wines um, and definitely worth the struggle, uh, as I'm sure anyone who's had the wines from that area will tell you. Um, moving into Southern Oregon, where um, Syrah is, you know, this the next um, highest planted grape variety as well. Uh, the the Umpqua Valley is a little more like the Willamette Valley in terms of its climate uh, profile. It's not quite as hot as the Rogue Valley, um, and it's a very thin valley here, so it's quite steeped, um, st quite steep the vineyards, um, except if you are planted down along the bench lands and the river systems, then you have some flat land to work with. But otherwise, most of the vineyards are quite high elevations on fairly steep slopes, really um, benefiting from the aspect um, facing to the sun to really ripen um, the fruit flavors. Um, give again cooling influences at night. Um, the Umpqua Valley has some of the highest diurnal temperature shifts um, in the wine world. Uh, so these grape varieties um, do get very cool at night and cool down quite considerably despite the temperature during the day being in the upper 90s. Um, so again, these fruit flavors are just very fresh and pure and pristine uh, because of those cooling influences in the evening. Um, and most of the grape varieties that are grown here are Iberian, Rhone varieties, Bordeaux varieties, along with Pinot Noir. So it really is um, an area that depending on your elevation and your aspect, you can almost grow anything here as well. Moving south into the Rogue Valley, the Rogue Valley starts to widen out a little bit more, especially on the eastern side, that sort of northeasterly of the I-5 and northeasterly of Medford in that Bear Creek Valley. Uh, these are wide open alluvial um, valleys, so very free draining um, this is where more of your Bordeaux and um, Bordeaux varieties um, and Iberian varieties are grown. And then the Applegate Valley to the west of Ashland and Medford um, is a cooler, thinner valley um, where you have slightly higher elevations and are really dominated by a lot of um, river alluvial benchlands um, plantings. So a lot cooler um, and and more moderate, um, more savory, uh, delicate fruited uh, Rhone varieties um, and Iberian varieties grown in that Applegate Valley as well. Again, they also get the um, influence coming in from the Pacific Ocean, um, but it has a little more um, area to travel through. Um, and a lot of these vineyards are planted on east-west lateral valleys, so they really do get that cooling influence coming in from the Pacific here as well. Um, but keep in mind in the Rogue Valley that most of the vineyards are at high elevation, so 1,200 to 2,200 feet in elevation. So this is where you're also delaying that ripening factor and really building in your ability to have more moderate, lighter bodied um, styles of wine, um, but still a protracted growing season. So you're getting flavor development without getting the high alcohols um, and not losing your acidity, that freshness of the acidity being really important in Oregon wines. 
Uh, so temperature and precipitation in Southern Oregon, um, you can see this diurnal temperature shift here is really um, indicated in those high um, in the in the temperatures here. So during the evenings, you're getting such a drastic drop in temperature that it's really buffering out a lot of the temperature exchange. Again, also these um, are really close proximity uh, ranges and mountains are having a cooling effect as well, where the high elevation um, cooling uh, temperatures are sucked down into the river valley and move through the vineyards. So you definitely get that um, cooling influence happening regularly in the afternoons, um, so much so that even though it's a 100 degree day or higher, by six o'clock, you'll be requiring um, a sweater to wear because of just how that large diurnal shift is happening um, and coming through that area. So lots of wind movement, lots of air movement down here, um, really helping to bring those more moderate, um, uh, complex wine styles together. Uh, the Bordeaux varieties, so Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc are really on the rise in Oregon as well. They've been very well planted and well documented in both Walla Walla and the Rogue Valley, but there's sort of a love affair that's starting to happen with Cabernet Franc in, uh, across Oregon as well. Um, it makes really lovely distinctive styles of wine um, in that medium bodied component um, with a lot, with quite a bit of complexity. <laughs> For, yeah, 40 to 50 degree temperature swings this last weekend down in the Rogue Valley as well. Um, but very, very um, reliant on that diurnal temperature swing happening down here. Um, and this is really uh, core to the, to the high elevation fruit and the alluvial soils that give those um, really nice energetic wines. Um, and capable of long ripening wines. So Cabernet Sauvignon, 5% um, of Oregon's plantings. Um, again, Cabernet Franc is around 1% um, coming up to 2%, but there's a lot of, um, of producers that are really excited by um, the plantings that are happening um, of Bordeaux varieties as well. Um, and again, they stay in that more moderate, medium bodied profile. They have really lovely cedary, um, pencil tannins that have nice fine structure and fine grain to them. Um, but most of the fruit um, flavor complexity is sitting in that black currant, black cherry, violets, um, some nice baking spice flavors happening as well. Um, a lot of um, uh, attention needs to be paid to how you extract the tannin profiles. Um, and in Cabernet, um, not so much in Cabernet Franc because um, the skins are a little thinner, but Cabernet Sauvignon um, can have the uh, very rustic um, firm tannins, um, but um, cool fermentations, gentle handling um, of, of the tannins and also uh, pressing off ferments a little early so that you're not at the high alcohol levels extracting a lot of tannin profile and bitter tannins. So very intentional winemaking practices to match the medium bodied fruit and fresh acidity um, with not digging, you know, bringing out overblown, over, um, uh, overly tannic wines that require, you know, so much aging that you can barely get to them within the dec first decade of their life. Uh, one thing that's really special to Oregon and is close to many people's hearts is the Tempranillo vineyards in the Umpqua um, Valley, where um, Abasala uh, were the first uh, folks to bring in Tempranillo um, and have really worked quite hard with um, the authorities in Spain um, and a lot of Spanish producers to bring in some really beautiful um, clonal selections of Tempranillo and find out what works best um, in Oregon's vineyards. So these really um, deep, um, you know, fault line marine sediment soils, a lot of sandstone, alluvial soils that allow the grapes um, root systems to go deep. Um, and as you can see, they're trained quite high here. That's Earl Jones standing in the vineyard with um, his 
with his Tempranillo fruit. And uh, he was one of the first to bring in these um, clonal selections. Um, but they do, um, you know, like Ribera del Duero and those regions in Spain that are high elevation, um, high diurnal shifts and have quite hot days and cool nights. Um, these uh, Tempranillo grapes in the Umpqua Valley do have a similar resemblance with just a little more freshness um, to those to those profiles. Uh, and of course, the aging considerations, um, everyone understands all of the different reserva levels uh, for Rioja and Tempranillo, Ribera del Duero and Toro in Spain. Um, but there's a lot of uh, producers that are playing around with the similar aging profiles um, and then also looking to make more fresher, earlier drinking styles as well that really highlight the beautiful purity and freshness of the fruit here um, instead of that extended aging system as well. So Tempranillo does incredibly well um, in actually every AVA in Oregon as well. There's several plantings of it um, in the Umpqua Valley, in the Rogue Valley, the Applegate Valley, several plantings in the Willamette Valley that are quite old um, and have really lovely blue and red fruit flavors as well and fresh tobacco um, flavor profiles. So um, you know, allowing the Willamette Valley to have a fully bodied, a fuller bodied red um, there's also Grenache planted in the Willamette Valley now, along with Menthea. Uh, and so these Iberian fruit profiles um, that are really um, lining up quite well with Spain's growing um, uh, profiles, their growing conditions. You know, a lot of um, Galician, um, a Galician uh, climate um, is comparable to much of the Willamette Valley in terms of when the rainfall happens, um, how much rainfall is received, and then those uh, long dry summers um, is very similar. We've got quite, a, we've got a couple of Menthea vineyards up here in, in the valley. Um, I work with one and then um, Abbey Road Works has some in its um, pocket as well. And then also obviously Anna Lemma up in the gorge was the first person to plant Menthea as well. Um, but really beautiful wines at low alcohol levels and lots of complexity as well. So I love the Iberian varieties um, for Oregon. It's a lot of fun. Um, so this is where basically where Tempranillo is planted all over and those classic Tempranillo flavors, cherry, dried fig, plum, cedar, tobacco, dill are, are all quite common. And depending on what, again, your aging preferences for Tempranillo. Um, but I find some of the most delicious um, Tempranillos to be handled a little bit more like uh, almost like Beaujolais in terms of a gentle extraction and really highlighting that just that delicious um, red fruited, blue fruited, um, energetic profile um, as being some of my favorite wines as well from, from the grape variety. But um, there's a Tempranillo Alliance that happens as well in Oregon. Um, and so there's some really great fun tastings that happen around um, the Tempranillo because it is a grape variety that's loved and grown in every ABA here. Um, coming back to Bordeaux and Rhone varieties, I've already touched on these. The, here's just an image of the Columbia Gorge on the left-hand side and the Applegate Valley on the right. Um, you can see just how important these river systems and mountain systems are to Oregon um, and to how they impact um, our, our really lovely, you know, fresh fruit flavor profile. Oh, I... I just got a message about a carbonic tempranillo. That sounds delicious to me. <laughs> Look forward to trying it, Dylan. Uh, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, and Merlot. Okay, this is really where we're having, um, starting to have a lot of fun. I think that Oregon makes some of the best Merlot uh, in the world that I've tried. Um, the Applegate Valley especially has some really beautiful old vine um, uh, Merlot vines uh, that are really just so elegant and everything that Merlot should be. Um, lots of strawberry, raspberry, plum, and, you know, lovely cigar box tobacco, um, fine grained tannins as well. Um, you know, sadly, Merlot went out of favor, um, you know, several years ago, uh, but hopefully someone's championing it and bringing it back. 
um, Cabernet Franc and Malbec. Again, Malbec here, um, you know, we have a couple of um, South American um, winemakers here that um, talk about how different Malbec is uh, in Oregon and who are just so excited about it because it retains its acidity here. It retains its um, purple and blackberry and blue fruit profile along with lots of violets and floral aromatics. Um, again, this concept of freshness in Oregon wines is really what makes them so easy to drink um, and so food friendly and also very age worthy as well. Um, Cabernet Franc, there's a lot of producers um, in the Willamette Valley that are sourcing fruit from Southern Oregon uh, for Cabernet Franc until some more plantings of Cabernet Franc happen in the Willamette Valley. Um, you know, Cabernet Franc in the Willamette Valley is grown. It's one of the latest um, grape varieties to be harvested uh, right at the end of October, but it produces, again, really lovely full flavor development because um, without pyrazines, because of us being able to open up the fruit zone and bring in uh, that UV light with the moderate um, heat and sunshine allows for Cabernet Franc at um, you know low alcohols or moderate alcohols, 13% alcohol, um, but with very full flavor development without the bell pepper um, characters that you often have in California and Washington um, Cabernet Francs and Malbecs. Uh, so really um, a future for border varieties happening here as well. At, currently, we still seem to see mostly varietal bottlings of all of these varieties. Um, there's not a lot of people who are blending um, all of them together at the moment. Um, so we're still really much, uh, very much focused on, on varietal bottlings. I think that'll probably start to change as we start to uh, introduce more and more plantings in <clears throat> in the traditional AVAs. However, because we're also trying to see what these great varieties do and what they're capable of, I think everyone at the moment is really committed to continuing that varietal landscape conversation um, just to see what what these varieties do on their own. And then after that, I think we'll start to see some really interesting blends happening. Um, you know, we are the new world. We are, you know, um, you know the US, we don't need to, um, you know, follow regulations that are implemented um, by a lot of regional groups um, like they have in Europe. So these um, concepts of uh, only blending, you know, Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc together um, should be going out the window and there should be a lot more experimentation happening with, you know, blending Pinot Noir and Cabernet Franc. I don't know, give Pinot Noir some, you know, some tannic backbone. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of things that can be done for producers who um, have the creativity and the interest to make um, the best wine that comes from their property. Um, but it's a, certainly an exciting place to be uh, in Oregon at the moment with how much is really capable of being grown here. Um, and we're really only limited by our imagination and, uh, and by the, by the um, you know, roots, uh, the clonal selections that are given to us as well. And yeah, Tom, that's a great point. Leah, Leah does make some really lovely, um, really lovely um, Gamay and Cab Franc um, blends as well. Yes, and lots of, oh my gosh, I love the, there's a comment here um, about the Italian varietals, especially Sangiovese and Barbera. Uh, there's Nebbiolo long planted in the Willamette Valley as well, but I love Sangiovese and Barbera um, actually from the Rogue Valley. Um, it's one of my favorite um, varieties down there. Unfortunately, we don't have um, statistical information on it. So it's um, all, uh, all I know are the few couple of vineyards um, that, that I see every now and then um, in wine judging or when I get down there to taste. Um, so there's, there's certainly um, a big, big opportunity for Italian varieties, um, especially with their, you know, freshness and tannin profile as well fits really well um, with the Oregon fruit profile as well. Very special. You are so special. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. 
Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Button. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com and sign up for my newsletter at exploringthewineglass.com. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe to help others find me more easily. And most importantly, tell your wine-loving friends, because if you like the podcast, they will too. Podcast music is Wine by Kievitz. Until next week, slancha. Right now.